Uh, folks, hopefully this is working according to plan. I would love it if everything was a nice, swift, uh, technological marvel that uh, everything worked as it was meant to, but there's bound to be hiccups tonight. Uh, apologies in advance. And I can already hear myself doubling back, so I've got this open somewhere. I'll try and find what I've got. There we go. <clears throat> so folks at home, um, just give us a minute or two just so we make sure everyone can hear. So David, sign check, can you hear me okay? Hi, I can hear you. Can everyone hear me? It's not a bad thing if you can't. <laughs> uh, Penny, what about you? Yeah, everything's clear. Are you okay? Hear me okay? Yeah, all seems to be hunky dory. Penny, say something. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> He is horrible. I mean, how does I even put up with him at all? I don't know. Uh, right, let me uh, pop out chat so I can keep an eye on the chat thing too. I didn't even realize I could pop out this chat. <clears throat> it's made life a lot bit easier than this last time. So folks for you who are uh, watching, uh, wherever you happen to be tonight, um, hello. This is the, the introduction bit. So hello, welcome to uh, Beyond Hammer Glamour. This is the second in our occasional series of In the Grip of Hammer conversations, which are being run by Cinepunked. Uh, so my name is Robert J.E. Simpson. I'll be your host for this evening. And uh, I'm just going to run through some stuff just before we get going. So thank you for joining us. Uh, let me explain how it works, and then we'll do proper introductions and get on with the chat, which is why you're all here. So this is a live stream event. <laughs> Bear with us in case of any technical mix-ups or faux pas, they do happen. Uh, we're going to run it as a fairly free-form conversation between our three panellists. Uh, you'll be able to comment along in the chat, but I'd ask you to be respectful, please, of both the panellists and fellow audience members. Uh, trolling in all its forms isn't welcome, It's not, nor is offensive or prejudicial language. You folks are sensible, you know what to do, but feel free to fire in questions and comments as we go through. We'll try and keep an eye on them and we'll feed them in where we can. So there will be opportunity to contribute. Um, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the comments. I think Penny's going to be keeping an eye on the comments too. We don't want to test David too much. We might just get him to focus on one thing. I don't know. Oh, no, I do actually have the... I've, <laughs> got I've worked up. out how to pop out the comments. Hey. And I can see them and I'm seeing everyone and hi, everyone. <laughs> um so we'll try and involve as many of you as possible when it's appropriate. And apologies in advance if I miss your comment or don't use it. It may be you've suggested something that we're planning on getting to anyway, or it's too tangential, or I don't know. I just don't see things because I'm getting old. Um, now, in our last conversation, we spoke about our shared love of the Hammer Horror films and a fair bit about our own engagement with the films and the community of fans around them. And tonight, we're going to focus in on something that seems to go hand in hand with Hammer Horror, what's normally referred to as Hammer Glamour. We did touch a bit on this the last conversation as well, but we wanted to do it a little bit further forward. Now, Hammer Glamour is so iconic, there's even an authorised book on the subject by Marcus Hearn, published by Titan Books. We've been teasing out a little of our thoughts on Hammer Glamour over on Twitter. Some of you will have noticed this over the last few months, but tonight we want to explore that a little bit further to reach beyond Hammer Glamour into some of the wider concerns. And in order to manage our appreciation of the evolution of Hammer, Hammer Glamour, uh, we thought we'd focus on the Hammer Vampire films. They basically cover the entire length of Hammer Horror properly, and uh, so we can actually sort of see the progression of Hammer Glamour within them. In this conversation, though, we're going to limit ourselves as much as possible to the first four Hammer Vampire films. That's Dracula 1958, The Brides of Dracula from 1960, The Kiss of the Vampire, 63, and Dracula the Prince of Darkness, 65. Uh, it mightn't sound like a lot, but believe you me, in our preparation chats, we had a couple of conversations about this before we did this. There is more than enough in terms of Hammer Glamour to deal with in any one of those films. So four might actually be a bit too much for us tonight as well. Now, even before we get into that, um, it's a rather sad evening. Uh, we got word literally an hour ago that uh, dear Veronica Carlson, uh, an actress who is uh, no, was not only a, a talented actress and artist, but someone who had come to epitomize for some of us, uh, Hammer Glamour, uh, has sadly passed today. So with that in mind, and because this is a Hammer Glamour conversation, we are going to derail from our original plans, and we're going to talk a little bit about Veronica as well and her work before we get into our other Hammer Glamour conversation. So bear with us on that too. Um, it's not a scripted event. We don't really know what each other's going to say. We're going to work with that too. And it wouldn't be a cinepunk event if we weren't free-forming it somewhere along the line. So uh, thanks, Veronica, for, for you know the, the work, basically. Um, but we'll talk about her in a second. Now, tonight I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in Hammer, David L. Radigan, who many of you will know as Hammer Gothic over on Twitter. And we are delighted to have a special guest with us in the form of Dr. Penny Goodman. Now, 
who are these strange people I know you're saying? I'm going to get David to introduce himself, and then Penny will introduce herself, and then I'll talk about myself. So, David, off you go. Hi, I'm David L. Radigan, and um, well, Robert's already said, I, I um, tweet at Hammer Gothic, and yes, I'm quite obsessed with Hammer Horror Films. Um, got a few few projects on the horizon with Robert about various aspects of Hammer. Um, and uh, is that as much as you want from me at this stage? No, you, I mean, you can talk a little bit more about yourself, David. Whatever you think of interest and relevance for tonight's conversation. Okay, okay. For um, oh well, in terms of relevance, well, as as you all know, I'm 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 a shameless gayer, and um, no, I mean you can't you can't really say that these days. There's no there's no, there's no shame in it. Obviously, this, this, this but, is live and being recorded, David. I mean, yeah, take it out of context. You know. Um, so uh, with the hammer glamour thing, obviously, I'm I'm not looking at it from a from a straight perspective. Um, and I am, as I think we, you know, we alluded to this in the last conversation. I, I do sometimes hear the comments and things about Hammer Glamour and about the, the Hammer Ladies or the Hammer Babes or the Hammer Girls or whatever. And um, and I'm kind of like, oh, that's, you know, kind of a, a little bit too much. Um, but then I did confess last time, I think, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a hypocrite on this. I do have a thing for Oliver Reed's nipples. Well, uh, uh, frankly, any any male nipples. I was watching Demons of the Mind the other night, and um, what's the actor's name? Paul Jones. I think he was a, was he a singer and maybe a DJ or something. Manfred like Mann. Oh right, okay. I'm not very up on my music from that era, so but I'll take your word for it. Um, and I think he I think he shows his nipples in that one too, and you know, and Shane Bryant is looking sadly a little pale in that one, mm. but he's <laughs> the stubble is very fetching. Um. So I'm not I'm not beyond the temptation to lust after a few hammer males myself. Um, so, but but see, my concern with hammer glamour is always that it doesn't detract um, from the uh, f- from what uh, from what the actors actually gave to the films. And I think in the ones we're we're going to be discussing tonight, there were some incredible performances, and and the reason we've one of the reasons we've got PJ. Goodman here, other than the fact she's absolutely fabulous and she's the queen of Hammer subtext, a title bestowed on her by Terence Fisher himself. No, sorry, no, no, I made up that that <laughs> title, but she is the queen of Hammer subtext. She has such interesting, uh, wonderful observations on all the films and, and things like that. Um, and and we really wanted that uh, female perspective on this. Um, so I'm really looking forward to uh, to hearing from her. Um, I, I guess we're going to say a bit more about Veronica Carlson in that regard in a second, but I'll let I'll let Penny introduce herself first. Thank you, David. Thank you for your uh, very kind introduction of me yourself. Um, so I know I saw Hammer's Dracula when I was eight years old, um, at which age my dad apparently judged that I was ready for that kind of thing. <laughs> and I think he was probably right. It probably like defined my personality really then for the rest of my life. Um, so like now I'm an academic and, and this isn't my specialist area. I'm a Roman historian, but I think most academics can kind of bring that same mindset to their hobbies. Um, so, yeah, I sort of have, have absorbed almost everything and anything and everything to do with Dracula generally. Um, and Ham- the Hammer films, I still think are basically the best Dracula films ever committed to celluloid. Um, so I'm very enthusiastic about them. Uh, shall I say a bit about Hammer Glamour, Robert? You can do, yes. Now, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so watching Hammer films from a female perspective, obviously, I mean, Hammer Glamour is two things, actually. It's outside the films and it's inside the films, isn't it? It's the kind of posed publicity shots, which are especially in Marcus Hearn's book. But then it's a quite different thing inside the films. It's a whole world of glamour, actually, not just about the women, but it is about how they're dressed up and they're made up and so on. Um, and yeah, they do look very beautiful. It's a sort of, it's a fantastical and alluring world um, to watch, but it does come with objectification in some cases, sometimes more than others. Um, so women watching these films have to sort of watch around that in some ways, it's sort of, it's a duality. Sometimes we're kind of having to discount it. Sometimes it can be, you know, alluring and sort of pleasant for us as well. And um, I think 
these films are sort of that that duality is inherent in the Hammer films and inherent in horror in a way. And that a lot of what gothic horror does is it's sort of saying, what if social norms were disrupted or overturned and repressed and subconscious things came out instead? And these films are made in the 50s and the 60s, the ones we're talking about tonight. They're going to be a gothic film doing those things. It's going to be kind of prodding around at what was transgressive for that era. And that means you're going to get independent women, female desire, queer desire on the screen. And the characters that embody those things are bound to usually die or be punished in some way at the end. But they're on the screen in the first place. I think that's one of the things women get out of horror that they don't necessarily get in other in other genres of films. Um, it's sort of you can kind of read against the grain and enjoy those characters while they're there, even if the kind of frame of the narrative is trying to say, not always very convincingly, well, this is bad and horrible and wrong and this must be put back in its box. So I think that's where the, the fun lies for female viewers, that you can you can choose to identify with those characters while they're on the screen. And some of them are really great characters, like David said. So, yeah. I think that's that seems to me... Sorry, Robert, I interrupted you. I'm allowed to interrupt Robert tonight. I'm not allowed to interrupt Penny. Okay, but good. Oh, I'm going to try not I'll to. I'll abuse that privilege. Um, it's easy done. <laughs> no, what I was going to say, that's quite analogous or analogous to the the, the queer or, or certainly the gay male perspective of watching these films because, yeah, it is a, it's, it's very much the films are made from... Um, the heterosexual male perspective but you don't have to dig deep to find lots of queerness and lots of gayness and lots to appreciate from a from a gay male perspective so um that seems to me very much like the the female perspective you've described there yeah i think they're bracketed together and as you guys know i'm by myself so that's also part of how i'm seeing these films um, I don't I don't think that really makes the hammer glamour kind of press my buttons exactly. Um, not the kind of pose publicity photos, but these we've got beautiful women on screen, like lit and made up and costumed to look incredibly beautiful. And when they're acting and they've got agency in their characters, that is absolutely amazing to see. And like as David just said, these films do subtextually most of the time but sometimes it pops up in the text as well they do at least acknowledge queerness in some ways and yeah it's on straight men's terms but it's there and for me like growing up watching these films in the late 80s the early 90s in Britain like again there were not many places like like there were not many places I was seeing kind of independent women or women expressing desire there were not many places I was seeing any kind of acknowledgement of queerness either so that's another thing that the gothic allows. So, uh, uh, as ostensibly the hetero straight bloke, <laughs> apparently, I apparently like I'm, the I'm, word I'm... of ostensibly there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, the straight bloke. As, I'm as, giving as, you a Frida Jackson style eye roll here. As the straightest bloke in the room tonight, <laughs> um, I suppose that these I'm the, I'm the token, uh, you know, target audience member. I guess is is the idea tonight. So. Uh, I should introduce myself as well. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, I'm Robert J. E. Simpson. Uh, Cinepunked is my organization, and you may recognize me on Twitter either as Avalard, uh, where I've been for a very long time, or as exclusive PhD. And that's not because I actually have a doctorate. I did start a doctorate looking at the early history of Hammer films, uh, whether distribution or exclusive films. Um, ongoing thing, lag, the whole saga about that. But my background in terms of, of, of Hammer, uh, some of you will know I've been involved with this for about 20 years now, um, including having worked for the company for a few years and uh, uh, recently published a book on The Wicker Man, which you should all buy if you haven't already got it. It's The Willing Fool. Um, Spectacle of The Wicker Man. Uh, David did some editing for me on it, so it's, it's it comes recommended by at least one member of the panel other than myself. Um, I'm, I may have helped edit and proofread. I'm not yeah. sure I've recommended it tonight. So Not tonight, no, but you have on other occasions. Um, well, you know, because so, I'm polite. Well, speaking of of this, uh, one of the things that we touched on last time was someone asked in the comments about the Hammer Glamour and what, you know, sort of who our kind of top Hammer Glamour toddies were, essentially. And there is, as, as Penny has said, this terrible tendency for us to focus entirely on the way that the female actresses that took part in the Hammer films were uh, marketed in a very sexualized way. 
Um, but that is often to belittle a lot of the contributions that they're actually making to the films. There is a meme that I loathe and detest that is doing the rounds every now and then um, about Hammer Glamour through the ages. And it ends with a picture of Olive and Meeting on the Buses as a sort of comparing that to everyone else. And which I think is very, very unfair on uh, Anna Karen, who also sadly died this week uh, in very tragic circumstances, um, but was a stunning actress in her own right. Um, and also, they've kind of missed the point. They clearly haven't watched Meet Me on the Buses because she is not there to be the hammer glamour in that film. Um, she is part of the, the ensemble cast. Um, but our, our kind of our, our preoccupation with this sort of visual, um, I think sometimes detracts. And Veronica Carlson, who has passed today at 77, strikes me as being one of those actresses that managed to push most people's conversation around hammer glamour into something else because while she was stunningly beautiful and aesthetically delightful to look at she also could act the chops off you um and her performances within the hammer films are uh, are incredibly important i i want to kind of just because i will forget otherwise i want to bring a couple of comments just to read them out to you um so, oh, Holger, Holger Hasse, otherwise known as Thorley Walters, uh, says, given the ba fantasy background of Hammer movies, I find it interesting that originally Glamour was a magical power, originally, uh, and says, so Walter Scott wrote that it's the magic power of imposing on the eyesight of spectators so that the appearance of an object shall be totally different from the reality. Ooh, which I think we can probably get some material out of as the evening goes on. Uh, and Andy Alice says that some of what you two have said uh, reminds him of Robin Wood's Return of the Repressed theories. And if that's something you would recognize, we'll come to the Return of the Repressed in a minute. Let's talk about Veronica. Um, so, I, I mean, she made a bunch of films for Hammer. Uh, any any particular thoughts in terms of her work and, and how she fits into the, the Hammer Glamour mold? I mean, have, have we even decided what Hammer Glamour means? David, you like you want to say something? Sorry, uh, no, I was, I was, I was just wondering who you, you might, you might have to start saying who, who, yeah. who can speak first, because otherwise we're. But I mean, I've taken it upon myself to speak first anyway. Um, uh, uh, Veronica Carlson. The thing is, she she started in Hammer with Dracula's Risen from the Grave, which is an absolute personal favorite of mine. Um, but I think in line with most of probably most of Freddie Francis's films, there's not, they're not terribly sophisticated. They're very sort of visually brilliant and, uh, and amazing and everything, but he wasn't, he didn't have sort of have the depth of Terence Fisher or the sophistication in, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't tend to get as much out of them sort of on a, you know, looking sort of into the subtext and stuff. And, and, and it wasn't a, for me, her character in Dracula's Risen from the Grave wasn't, a particularly intriguing character it was a little bit sort of it was quite fairy tale the fairy tale lovers and i mean maybe freddie francis won I, I think he wanted to do more with with the lovers but i don't know what he wanted to do but for me the her standout performance came a, a couple of years later well one a year later uh, 1969 frankenstein must be destroyed and that's a revelation because of course she is again the you know she's there for the for the sex appeal and we all know because we we discussed this last time. I think briefly. Um, probably don't want to discuss it too much tonight. But the infamous rape scene, mm. um, Veronica and, and Peter Cushing, and obviously Veronica had certain thoughts about that, and she told a story about how that came about. And but there's still some dispute about, um, you know, who, whose idea the rape scene was and whether it was in the original script script and all that. Uh, but I've always found her performance through the whole thing and her her response to the to the rape scene very convincing she's just so utterly robbed of all her the next day she sort of she comes across as like robbed of all her peace hmm. um and for me that's just an absolute barnstorming performance that whole film for her um she's she just she has the soul ripped out of her in that film and she put she portrays it so very well um, so I think she was an excellent actor and, you know, it's, it's sad that she didn't really get more good roles because she had, she did horror of Frankenstein, which we have probably all have mixed feelings about. I'm not a great fan. In fact, I'm so little a fan. I forgot when I, when I mentioned Veronica Carlson's passing on, on Twitter, I forgot to mention horror of Frankenstein. 
I, I said that she just did the two Hammer films. But of course, yes, she did that with Ralph Bates. And I think I'm going to watch that again because I don't think it's an unwatchable film. Mm. I will revisit it. And I think I'll probably look particularly at what Veronica Carlson does with that terrible material. Um because I imagine she does, probably does something quite special with it. But yeah, Frankenstein must be destroyed as a standout. And of course, she was in uh, a couple of later uh, horror films. The Ghoul um, stands out. Uh, again, a, a film that provokes mixed feelings among fans. Um, but for me, Frankenstein must be destroyed is one of those films where you really do go beyond the hammer glamour. She's there for the sex appeal, um, but she she turns in such a good performance. So she was a brilliant actor. Yeah. Penny? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I can really add much to what David said about most of the films he's talked about, not least because, to be fair, it's been a while since I've seen most of them. So I'll defer to David on that. But I, I'm going to defend her in uh, Risen a little bit. I think I think her range is actually, she's asked to do quite a lot. Like, I know it's, a, you're right, it's a simple story of the lovers, but she gets towards the end of the film, um, and she's having to follow Dracula through the woods and all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, she's she's being asked to show sort of distress um, and and inner conflict and all that sort of stuff. I think she does actually do it pretty well. Um, so I think that film is enough to me to convince me of her range. Um, I'm just looking in the, the the chats here. Obviously, it's a bit of a shock to to hear this tonight. Um, I, I mean, it's it's also the sad part of some of the films that we adore is that everybody involved with them is now at an age where, sadly, as there's fewer and fewer of them left, the passings are becoming far too frequent. But there's a few people there who've uh, have kind of passed their their kind of comments on it. Quite uh, Thunder Films. Uh, who else we got there? Uh, Joy Robinson. Hi, Joy. Um, Andy Ellis. First is heard about was on this tonight. So sorry, Andy. We have to be the bearer of bad news. Um, Darren Bafoy, uh, there's Matt Gemmell, he said he put in a comment regarding Veronica and the Hammer Lovers, it says she's a beautiful woman and a fine actress, we met many times over the years and she simply couldn't have been sweeter, a sad day indeed. Um, who else we got there, uh, we've also got, Quiet Thunder says that uh, nothing can beat her turn as Anna and Frankenstein must be destroyed, oh sorry it's Sam, uh, and then Andy else agrees, Darren Bafoy says personally think Veronica and Jacqueline Pierce were two of the best female actresses in Hammer films. Jennifer Daniel was impressive too. Uh, we'll get around to Jennifer in a bit, hopefully. And Matt says Veronica's first performance from Hammer was undoubtedly Frankenstein. Uh, finest performance for Hammer was undoubtedly Frankenstein must be destroyed. She deserves so much better in future outings. Yeah, I, I mean, to, to put my own pennies worth in, Horror Frankenstein, she's criminally wasted in that film. Um, she's not given much to do and she doesn't have the screen presence that we know that she's capable of commanding. It's a very, very strange film from that perspective. Um, for me, those early films are, are, are fascinating and Frankenstein must be destroyed. Dave and I have talked about this at length and also on Twitter about just the range of that performance and indeed that, that rape sequence. And it's not just that in itself, regardless of what the story is about how that film was constructed, it seems like it's a performance that is measured and planned from start to finish because she goes through a range of emotions and then shows the trauma of what is happening to her and the deterioration in a way that I think a lot of performers who were less capable simply wouldn't have done. Um, but I think for me, in terms of Hammer Glamour as well, that she sort of encapsulated it with those the photographs in the graveyard that we see. It's a sort of stunning set of promo images, which like when I saw those as a teenager, captivated me um, and, and are shots that I go back to in my head over and over again, um, just as it's sort of really encapsulating what Hammer is. It's about death and about sex, really. Sexy death. Oh, I was um, going to add actually her in the hearse, like draped over Dracula's coffin in Risen. It's that yeah. perfect combination as well. Sexy death. <laughs> I, I was going to say the same because, of course, that's, it's that same sort of, you know, death graveyard imagery that you get in the publicity photos, but it's within the film. And she, yeah, she is. She draped over the, she's practically making love to the coffin. And I posted about this a few weeks ago because there's a, there's a similar scene in uh, Taste the Blood of Dracula with Lin Linda Hayden, mm -hmm. who I think was a bit younger, actually. I don't even, she might have even been she was about 16, underage, yeah, 16 yeah. or 17. Um, and I did wonder if that we get that imagery uh, that explicit in other hammer films of you know the of the of the female 
literally, you know, lying on top of the coffin, sort of, you know, kissing it or embracing it or making love to it or whatever. Mm. Um, but it's it's an intriguing image. I think I think it's a good point for us to jump into our, our kind of a wider conversation as well. But I didn't want to not we, we we collectively didn't want to not acknowledge Veronica's passing today. I think we're all I mean it's it's fresh news. Um I haven't sort of felt this kind of weird since Christopher Lee passed and I was at a conference in Paris on Hammer. And it's just like to get that news and then have to go in and talk about the very topic is a is a strange situation for us. Um just to pick up on some more of the comments. Uh so Andy says Great Quiet Thunder, Veronica's performance and destroy the suburb. Uh Darren Bafoy, uh done that bit. Uh da, 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 da. Uh, Frankenstein must be destroyed, getting lots of praise here as well. Joy Robinson says, says horror Frankenstein is a mess. We should really just do a whole pod on that sometime. Um Quiet Thunder says feels like she's wrestling with her sense of morality and risen too, being a young lover with a religious family. Uh Tony Sullivan says uh, maybe Bram summed up Hammer Glamour. Uh, he says, which I'm assuming is Bram Stoker, says, there was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. And Joy Robinson says, sexy death. That pretty much sums up all of my interests. <laughs> so sexy death, I guess, is the theme for tonight. Um... <laughs> Just another observation. Sorry to butt in. Um, yeah, I like I like the the observation about the the sense of morality in in Dracula's Risen from the Grave, and I think that was probably one of the earliest of those sort of Fra Frankenstein slash Dracula films. I guess it was more the Dracula films, mm. where increasingly they became about the generation gap and the sort of teenage lovers in conflict with the older generation, um, and and that was a particularly interesting one because you got the young lovers, and then obviously the Monsignor was her sort of kind of like an adoptive father. I think he was a uncle in that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but actually the, the Monsignor comes around. He's, he, he starts to um, go, he goes from being quite pompous, quite a pompous windbag and throwing, uh, throwing Paul out of his, out of the house for, for confessing his atheism. And um, he comes around and sees, sees what's important. Um, and that's, I guess that is quite a, yeah, I guess that that is there's some depth there to what what Veronica what Veronica and, and Rupert Davies's relationship does there and what happens to the character. So, but what I like about these conversations and what I um, and particularly you know having conversations on Twitter with with Penny and Robert is I get all these ideas for you know things to look for next time I watch the film. So Penny only has to say, "Oh no, there's actually some depth there," and. And I'm like, right, I have to watch that film again through Penny's eyes. And um, yeah, I may, may reassess. I, I love Dracula's Risen from the Grave, but uh, just not for those um, reasons. But I'll, yeah, and I'll do the same with Horror of Frankenstein and see if, um, see if Robert's comments about Veronica stand up. Well, that, let's 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 take ourselves back a little bit and let, let's look at sexy death from the word go. I think I, I, I mean, I, I think that's a pretty good summary of what Hammer is all about. It's the, the the USP that the company had was to to combine the sex and violence. It was the very thing that the censors loathed and detested, and it's present right from the very first horror film they do. I mean, the the glamour element of of Hammer glamour has always existed. There has always been the attractive female starlet that is used within the films in order partly to get bums on seats. Frequently, the part is is fairly redundant. Um, I mean, I did talk today, I posted a thing on Twitter about Elizabeth Welch, uh, who was born in 1904 on this day. Um, you know, Ham one of Hammer's very earliest leading ladies, uh, a, a non-white leading lady as well from a mixed race background, which is, is fascinating. There are very few of those within the Hammer leading stars, um, but also was a character that was given a little bit more to do. Then it goes through a phase where it sort of it, it ebbs and flows, but we're going to restrict ourselves to the Hammer horror films pretty much, and we're going to restrict ourselves to the vampire cycle because we need to find some way of working this through. And the vampire films allow us to go right the way from Dracula, right through actually until the modern Hammer with Let Me In, which is still continuing the sort of vampiric um, depictions. And there's, the Frankenstein films don't allow us to do that as much as we would love them to. Um, so. We start off with Dracula, which I'm, I'm going to put forward the, the, the suggestion that, that Dracula is marketed on Hammer Glamour and Hammer Horror with that glorious poster 
uh, that, that, that declares the terrifying lover who died yet lived and don't see it alone, which I think is meant to be a shout out to all the women. But, you know, quite frankly, I don't think I want to go to the cinema on my own. I don't always enjoy it. It's nice to have a friend to kind of sit and chat with afterwards. Um, but for you, for you, um, how do we feel that the, the glamour works in this? And when we talk about beyond hammer glamour, we're trying to take this away from just looking at piece, at looking at, at, at performers as eye candy. I think it's, it's probably fair to say that I think is the reductive view of Hammer Glamour is there. They're purely as, as sort of set dressing. Nice looking set dressing, but set dressing is all they're, they're there for. Whereas actually we're, we're arguing that there's more to it for anyone who's, who's following. So um, a Penny, any, 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 where do you want to go with this one? Can we start with Valerie Gaunt because she's the, she's the first glamorous face that appears in the screen. And would you mind, Robert? You know, I sent you some screen caps. Have you got the one of her when Jonathan first meets her and he's literally on his knees in the hall when she arrives? Can you put uh, that up? I've I've got them all. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, hand. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this it's is just, this is where we work with our primitive technology. So, folks, I did warn you at the start. Bear with us whenever this is happening. Um, it's just the visual of that scene. I think um, it's really helpful to be able to. That's it. Perfect. So, okay. So I think this scene really kind of picks up some sort of contradictory things that are almost deliberately bumping up against each other in this film. Um, so here she is, she's just walked in, you can see her skirt. She kind of catches him unawares, she's coming silently, she's towering over him. He, as I say, is on his knees. He's actually literally doing domestic labor here because he's picking up the food and stuff that he's accidentally knocked off the table. So all of that sets up a kind of gender role reversal, which almost gives her a sense of power in that first meeting. Whoa, it's all changing. Is it all right? Steady now. Um, but at the same time, the camera is about to do that classic shot that often appears in films of um, panning up her body. So we see her trim waist, we see her heaving bosoms. Now that's definitely objectifying. So that's not really empowering her or sort of speaking about her agency. Actually, it basically says the least important part of this woman, which we'll get to last, is her head. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's kind of the nub of what's going on in these films with the women. Like, on the one side, it's saying this is something a bit scary, a woman who's got power, sort of in a more powerful position than a man, that's something to be feared, something to be put back in its box. But it's also presenting her as something that you might desire. I think that's kind of deliberate, troubling conflict that's there. And this is an example of what I mean as a female viewer, what, watching this sort of stuff, because it's sort of up to us which side of that we lean into. Like, we can focus on her as a, as a powerful character, or we can be put off by the objectification. I choose to do the former, but... They're both there, and I think I think that's kind of it's not a mistake. I think it's almost deliberate for all viewers, not just female viewers, that it's this sort of troubling um, match of power and uh, something something that's powerful, but that you might also desire. I think that's probably being deliberately offered to the male viewers as well. Mm -hmm. So I can talk more about Valerie; she's great. <laughs> that's, the, that's the key thing. That's why I wanted that screen cap anyway. No, I, well, I, I'm. I think that um, focusing on values are, is a good idea. I'm just going to unshare this if I can for a second. Yeah. There we go. Because I've got too many windows open. <laughs> David, do you want to say something there? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that she's very much uh, the sort of temptress in that scene. Almost the um, uh, ad, it's sort of an Adam and Eve thing. Um, going right right back to the garden, the 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 man succumbing to the um the woman's temptation and he he's absolutely from from the minute she appears he's head over heels he's he's kind of giggling nervously um it's it's quite funny really and then and then as soon as she starts her spiel um which i don't know how i don't know how manipulative we think that is how much truth there is to what she says about being held a prisoner whether she's simply trying to manipulate him into uh, you know to, uh, into being her victim or, or she she genuinely wants rescue, or there's a conflict there, which is probably more likely the case. Um, 
as I think in perhaps in some of the later films we'll discuss, there was this, you know, with like the Baroness Meinster, there's the, you know, how much how much is she really looking for release and how much is she trying to entrap someone to be a victim for herself or for her son? Uh, and and that's that's what I get from uh, from Valerie Gaunt in that scene. She's uh, the temptress. And then I think some of that sort of garden, uh, some of that Garden of Eden imagery comes back later in the film, I think, with... Um, oh, I almost got onto plugging my next article, but I won't. Um, but Because I did write about this in a recent article. Um, but I, but he, I won't. He he's, I he's can always, to you. It's it's coming I can, out. I can always I can always say at the end as a you know <laughs> taster so people can go buy it. Um, um, yeah, yeah. But I, th- I mean, I, th- I think that the I suppose it's a variation of the femme fatale in a way to have a an attractive woman that is there to lure the the, the pathetic heterosexual male into their ultimate demise. Um, and it works incredibly well because it, it is that that sense of being drawn to something that you know is bad for you. I mean, many of us who are, are engaged in this conversation, probably those of us on the chat as well, may well have found in their personal lives that they're drawn to people like that. You know, the, 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 the partners that you're told that you really shouldn't be near, but you can't help but be near. Um, that is the sexy death. It's 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 that that potential to achieve something but also not and almost moral morally i wonder if by having something that is both sexy and bad allows you free reign to do the things that you're then gonna do so whenever it comes around to time to stake this beautiful thing it's okay because they're 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 kind of not that important yeah i suppose i see what you mean like she is she's asked for it but i think i think Going back to what David said about sort of whether what she's saying is is true or a ruse, I think he's right that it's both. Mm. Um, so the, if it's if it's all a ruse and it's terrible, that gives Jonathan reason to stake her. But I think like he genuinely does feel sympathy for her. I think David said that a moment ago. Mm. I mean, she, I think she she's doing it very cleverly. She's she's absolutely expertly got her claws into him. Um, and I love that she's at, she actually gets straight in there and goes for him before Dracula even turns up. Like, she has no hesitation. She's just going uh, for this potential victim that she's seen. She does it perfectly and snares him in her, in her net. And it works so well that actually that's what causes his death. Because mm. a common sort of fan comment about this is, oh, how stupid he should stay Dracula first. But this is why. It's because she's got her claws into him so deeply she's even though he's supposed to be a vampire hunter and he's supposed to know she must be a vampire he'd think he'd realize uh, but she nonetheless she lures him in so effectively she's made him feel sympathy for her anyway hmm. so i think what's happening when he goes into the crypt and stakes her um is rather than doing a sort of pragmatic calculation okay i'll deal with the big bad first and then her I think what he thinks he's doing actually is being moral and gallant because he really has come to feel for her. And we get stuff later with Lucy about how um, staking her is a release and it gives her peace. I think that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to um, give of the two vampires he's faced with. I think he's trying to give the one he feels more pity for Mm. release first. So that's how that all plays out. And that was something that kind of... um, became really apparent for me on viewing in preparation for this evening when, when I knew we'd be thinking about gender and sexualities and really paying attention to her character made me understand that crypt scene much much better well she she, she is the vamp <laughs> I mean unashamedly she is she is vamp from from word word go and I I mean I, I suspect that the, for me I guess as a viewer I suspect that there is a, a certain genuine vulnerability about her and she is kind of trapped I think she would rather be in control and not have Dracula running over her um, because she doesn't seem drawn to Dracula in the way that she's definitely drawn to Harker, whereas later on in some of the other vampire films, the victims are often drawn to the person that has, I suppose, turned them. Um, I want to just pick up again, there's a few comments in the in the feed here. So Joy Robinson has said, uh, Valerie Gaunt's character embodies a paradox. It presents her as powerful. She uses her agency to ensnare Harker, but it also also as a helpless prisoner, Dracula. I think the truth is somewhere in between, which I think we're sort of in agreement about. Yeah. Um, she says the heterosexual would-be heroes become immediately useless around a beautiful woman. 
typical blokes, uh, and these women use it as a source of power. Uh, Andy Ellis says, excellent observation from Joy and the Paradox and Gaunt's character, perhaps reflected in her flimsy dress, vulnerability, and those lovely blue shoes. Strength. Or if you, if you were watching my Twitter account the other night, there are not just a pair of blue shoes, there's also a pair of lovely gold pump things as well, uh, wedges. Um, so Quiet Thunder says, Gaunt is also fierce like an animal in the role, perfect duo with Lee in that scene. Animal, I, I think when we get to Vampire Circus, probably in a couple of conversations time, animals and vampires are going to be a very strong conversation point. And uh, Joy says she thinks she's definitely playing into Harker's men's preconceived assumptions about femininity and women's victimhood. And uh, Matt Gemmel has admitted, he says, let's face it, we're easy game. And Matt has met most of the Hammer Glamour ladies. So I think that's, if anyone's going to say that, it should come from Matt. Uh, oh gosh, there's more comments. Matt, I agree about her being like fierce and giving almost as good as she gets in that fight in the library. And I actually think it's really important that um, she's quite willing to disobey and go against Dracula, even though ultimately he does kind of overpower her. But that kind of is paired with Mina and Lucy, who are also kind of going against their men folk and conspiring with Dracula against them. And I like that that's on both sides, like the vampire men and the human men have, have got women kind of throwing off their authority um, and undermining them. You get a real feel like, you know, from when this is made, 1958, it, it could sort of feel like women's liberation mm -hmm. about to burst out in these characters, the, the vampire woman and the, and the human women. It's, it's not just the human women, it's on the vampire side as well. Where do we take them? Sorry, David. <laughs> this is how I've, I, I don't want to raise my hand, so I'm just doing the goldfish thing when I want to speak. Um, yeah, I think there's. I think there's. You know, it, these scenes are, are capable of two readings, and that's because, that's because, as as we said right at the start, these were all made from a, a very male heterosexual point of view, uh, and yet to use um, uh, to use Penny's phrase, uh, the the subtext is like waiting to burst out, um, and that you know the women's liberation or whatever, uh, and I think perhaps on the surface when Jonathan Harker goes to stake um, to stake Valerie Gaunt first, uh, there's that element um, of uh, kind of blaming the woman first and, and punishing the woman for her sexual licentiousness. And we've been, um, as I said on my, on my Twitter feed this week, how ironic it was that this morning uh, I was preaching in church and this evening I'm talking about Hammer Horror uh, <laughs> online, and but they're actually in terms of reading the scriptures and getting something out of them and reading a film, they're very similar processes. And one thing that in a little study group I've been part of at church recently is that we've been talking about is this story of the woman caught in adultery in, uh, in John's gospel, I think, um, where the, wo the woman's caught in adultery and the woman is hold hauled up before the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests, and they're about to stone her. And, um, and the man is, is nowhere to be seen. Um, they're, they're going to stone the woman, but obviously it takes two to tango. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so it seems that that's sort of an ancient story of um, men going after the, you know, even if even when the even when the woman is less culpable, clearly mm. Dracula is the one that should be staked, um, and yet Harker goes to to punish the woman first. But I think that's I think that's one reading. But I I, I love Penny's reading as well. That's kind of the 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 subtext that is try, trying to burst out maybe <laughs> i'm just reading through the comments so oh, I, I think because of our, our our time constraints as well tonight and we literally could spend two hours talking about dracula and we would never move beyond that so what i'm going to suggest is actually we start looking at the four films across them and see what what sort of threads come come and go it may seem a little bit more eclectic but I think it might make more sense. So we're talking about Dracula, Brides of Dracula, Kiss of the Vampire, and Dracula, Prince of Darkness. I'm just going to comment a couple more things here in the feed. So um, Darren Befoy says, this thing is deliberate manipulation. She's using her beauty to lure the stupid sex crazed men into her trap so they become her victims so she has the upper hand over the men anyway. So I see as uh, more. Uh, Morticia Visuals. Well, Patricia says Jonathan's a bit of a wet blanket, leaving aside my love of Cushing as Van Helsing. He doesn't compare in terms of screen presence or physicality. Uh, yeah, well, strange that one. Um, oh, sorry. See, so so uh, Darren says that uh, Valerie Gaunt thinks it's an empowerment thing. Girl power. Well, they didn't quite do this, but I, I after watching Space, I always feel you can't say girl power without doing this. 
Uh, Holger says, how long will it take until someone points out the phallic connotations of the stake? <laughs> Holger, you got a one-track mind. We have to uh, say about stakes. We, we weren't going to go we'll there tonight. To <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say that Robert this week, and we might get to this, managed to find um, phallic connotations in a sort of little wine goblet. And I just thought, I just thought, if you see a phallus in that, you need to see a doctor. <laughs> but no, you can you can argue your case later if it comes up. You've been out for a drink with me, David. Have I not done that to you yet? <laughs> well, no, I've I've not seen if. Oh well, no. Let's not go there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Joey says one of the most interesting things about Hammer's Dracula is that he's at once a sexual liberator but also an oppressive patriarch so much contradiction and uh, Morticia says she was thinking of the glamour of the men on screen in Dracula compared to the women Harker looks quite like a grump schoolboy in comparison to Harker so we can talk a little bit in a minute about the, the, the way that the glamour works between the men and the women um, are we in agreement that, the, that, that Hammer vampirism is about sex? I mean, I, that, I think I that's the line that I take, but... I, I think it's pretty clear, and it. I think we all know the story about how um, after Mina has her kind of big night out with Dracula and she's met him in The Undertakers... This is David's favourite story. <laughs> she's got her fur collar around her neck and everything. Terence Fisher told her to act like she'd just come back from the greatest sexual night out of her life. So it's there in the directorial comments that they were telling the actors to treat it that way. And it, it comes up with some of the others as well. Um, always Terence Fisher telling people to play up the lesbian connotations, their lines and things like that. So I think, yeah, I think they knew what mm. they were doing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that he has a re reputation as such a conservative director. But again, it's this it's the conflict between what's on the surface, mm. which is uh, which quite often does look very conservative, like the, you know, the way the women are punished for being for being sexual and all this. And then what's under the surface, which is all this absolute mad sexiness. And I think it it only gets more and more kinky as as the vampire films go on mm. to the point where uh, Robert alluded before to to vampire circus. And uh, and that's one that. Penny and I discussed very briefly the other the other day on Twitter um, because Penny didn't didn't really like it. Um, oh, I think your comment I think your comment was uh, because there I some things I, that could have gone undeveloped. Yeah, because I think <laughs> I, I think said. because my comment was um, was to observe how a lot of the themes that are present sort of quite subtextually in the in the earlier Hammer films um, like Dracula and Brides of Dracula are suddenly made very explicit in a film like uh, Vampire Circus, where uh, so especially the sort of pedophilic angle and stuff like that. Mm. And yeah, your your comment was, you know, some of those things should uh, um, could have gone, uh, yeah, undeveloped or, you know, because it, yeah. it is quite, it's uncomfortably, yeah, it's more than suggested in that film. Mm. Like a, um, a, with, these, with these earlier films we're talking about, there's a kind of a layer of plausible deniability <laughs> in that the narrative is going to end, isn't it? You know, with, with conservative morals re-established. And that allows them to get away with quite a lot um, insofar as the censors would allow them before they get to that stage. But yeah, the, increasingly as you go along, that plausible deniability framing is just removed and it's just all out there. It's it's funny because when I was a when I was a teenager getting into these films the first time when I was still quite involved in, in in churchy things myself and part of my um part of the attraction I find about these films and part of my justification I guess for being so absorbed by them was that it felt that they were classic kind of good and evil tales good always won pretty much and there was a nice morality to it I've got a bit older I've I've experienced a little bit more of the world in the twenty years since so and um. Like now, I just see the subtext everywhere, and I can't see the straight morality. Even Van Helsing, who, you know, we kind of take as a as a pretty much a, a Puritan figure, you know, I'm aware from certainly from having looked at the original scripts and stuff. He's he, you know he he's Boone and uh, Marianne. You know, I mean that that the, there is another relationship there, and he is not the you know this this pure individual that we're led to believe. So the sexuality is is quite interesting. It's it again. It's it's the us and the them. Um. I'm just going to comment as well. So Andy L says, Hammer's vampirism is mainly about sex, but also about power and class, uh, which I, I, I think mm. is true. I think that's the Hammer horror films are about class a lot. Um, but because I think we're looking at, at glamour, I guess power and sex is, is probably where we want to be at. Is it? 
Do we want to be it's a part of Glassley, like think about the Minsters, especially where it's explicit that everyone in the surrounding area is their tenants. And that, mm. that's a common way that vampirism is used as a metaphor for that kind of either political or aristocratic sort of yeah, um, exploitation of, of the ordinary people. Can, uh, I think we should talk about Mina. Um, and I, I think oh. the reason we need to spend a bit of time about Draca is because it sets the groundwork for whatever comes next. And I, I, I mean, we, we talked briefly, I mean, I think all those other elements like incest and pedophilia and all the rest of it are here in this first film as well. If you haven't noticed it, that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, but, but Mina's sexuality, the way that her glamour is, is portrayed is rather different to, to Valerie's. Um, either of you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, she's more sort of glowing, whereas, as she said earlier, yeah, Valerie is sort of, is very vampy. I, I, um, yeah, her, this, their makeup kind of is quite different. Valerie's is rather more kind of stark and gothy. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a scene, isn't there, that was restored from the Japanese reels with the more detailed um, cut of Dracula's predation on Mina that is incredibly erotic. Um, and as she sort of, it, it's quite similar, um, remembering Ver Veronica Carlton, it's quite similar to the predation scene in Risen, actually. It was quite a, it was quite a revelation to realise that that had actually been in the first film all along, um, but not in the UK and US releases. Uh, yet it had been there in the Japanese reel, so it's an interesting sort of sense of yeah, it, it, progression. It, it's a lot more tastefully done in the, in, mm. in the original Dracula. In the in Dracula's Risen from the Grave, you get that scene, and it's it, it's got got a really shaky camera. It's all blurred because obviously the the camera presumably wasn't really designed to go in that close. You get a few of these. You get that in Kiss of the Vampire as well, when Noel Willman comes into the camera with his fangs and it gets all blurry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it almost Dracula's Risen from the Grave almost gets a bit trashy when it has that point of view thing because it's all like very you know like jeff franco or something it's um yeah it's a it's a bit um tasteless where i'd, I'd love uh, for me the restored scenes of mina's seduction in dracula i had far more to the story than the much celebrated uh, a restored ending with all the mm. extra gore and all that which i did love all that you know but but for me those those extra bits at the end with Dracula's disintegration, they could have just been, um, you know, a DVD extra. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have mattered to me if they weren't in the film itself, but the extra shots in Mina and Dracula's scene really add something. Um, you, you sort of feel that she's much more complicit and desiring of what's happening. Um, I, I don't think I've watched it in, in years and I watched it the other night. And it, that's what struck me was that suddenly, you know, this isn't a case of, I always felt, particularly the way that this film was marketed, there was a kind of rapey quality to the way that Dracula comes across on this. But with those additional few seconds, it feels like this is no longer a kind of forced rape scenario. This is something that's actually a kind of wanton, please, for the love of God, get me away from that horrible Michael Goff and, 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 and do things to me. You do feel rather sorry for Mina at the end. When she ends up with the incredibly milk toast, bland, <laughs> mediocre yeah. Michael Goff, it's like, and and again, it goes back to that traditional conservative morality that's on the surface. It's weird. Where, that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go on, go on, David. Carry on. No, you're, I'll, I'll come in like, after. you know, she's no. she's a, she's a, in her place. You know, she's restored to being a you know a, a housewife in a lovely marriage, and um, but yeah, Michael Goff is just so. In, insipid and and wet as someone described jonathan harker but he's even more wet than or or less wet as the case might be um than than jonathan harker because like you know when mina starts getting sexy in the hallway michael goff can't get away fast enough he's so threatened by it yeah no what i was gonna say was that um you're right like, I, I feel really sad for her in that ending you wonder how happy they're going to be 
and we talked about earlier how Van Helsing is almost a Puritan. And obviously Dracula is this kind of very violent patriarch as well. So actually one thing that's just totally missing in these films is any kind of more positive model of masculinity that might be kind of worthy of these women like Mina and Lucy. We've seen that they're not happy with their actual husbands or fiancés. Mm. Wouldn't be happy with Dracula either because he would throw them across the room. And then Van Helsing is the, is the one sort of man we're kind of asked to admire and see as good, but he's almost totally sexless. He doesn't seem to have any family connections. He's mm. totally focused on his work. So what are these women supposed to do in the end? Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. The the I, I think Van Helsing, in the first film, he's, he's presented as like this mirror image of Dracula and Dracula is absolutely unrestrained he just the minute he gets a chance he turns totally feral um he's just he's just sex 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 and he's all over all over women whether they want it or not he's a wild beast and and yes Van Helsing is more or less asexual he's like the celibate priest um and he's completely in control of all his uh, all his faculties or of all his he's, he's got such discipline which in part is is very admirable because I love it when he's like when he's in a situation with um, the housekeeper and she's she's admits that she's opened the window uh, and and so she's indirectly responsible for for Lucy's death and you can see he clearly wants to slap her black and blue because what an idiot to open the windows when she's been told not to uh, but you can see the visible restraint in his face that he's holding back and I really like I, I like that aspect of self-discipline but on the other hand yes he's he's asexual and and something robert alluded to before um was i, th I think you said he's boning marianne or Mar is it marianne right. or marianne yeah. mm. um I i'm not sure he is because I i'm not sure that's to do with the way he's seen by the other characters and the way he's presented is that they see him as an object of attraction, but I don't know if he does. I think I sent you a copy of of some of the script pages for this from the, yeah. the, the from the, the, the oh, previous you? version. I don't read anything you send me. That's the problem. <laughs> well, I know this is the case, um, but it's more clear that there's a romantic relationship, and I think it still comes through in some of the scenes within the final version of of Bride's Dracula. Also, we know that he produces children because we're looking at his yeah. his, his, his descendants in AD seventy two and and Satanic Rites. He has to have had sex and reproduced at least once and i think it's with marianne i mean in, in my head sex. Holy I think shit. We're being yeah. a bit retrospective like, perhaps like i'm not sure the people that made dracula I, I, no but it's yet. but it's, it's, yeah. it's my head canon but i, I just want I'll, I'll, let me let me bring in some more comments and then we'll, we'll kind of come by this again because I, I i don't want to miss them as well it's like they're, okay. they're here with us i want to you know some of this stuff's good so um matt gamel has suggested that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar um, because you know, I, I know we read some stuff into this, and some of the stuff we all know may or may not be there. Um, but part of the fun about exploring art and literature and film is is sort of reading other things and projecting things and using those as a form of discussion. That's what these gothic stories particularly un unleash, isn't it? Yeah. All that subtext is, is cigars never out. just a cigar in these. Yeah. Um, but he does agree that it's certainly about sex, especially forbidden kinky sex, and its pitfalls, as in Kiss the Vampire. Uh, tonight, tonight, Gemmel, a cigar is a penis. Let me get it out of the way. So, you know, if you don't like that, no. Okay. No, no, I hear him. I, I, that could have been in reference to something specifically said. I it, suspect it, it might have been in reference to the goblet. It, 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 I think it was, but also... Sometimes like part a goblet of, is a goblet. It is. And sometimes it's just fun to start, like, that's that, uh, who was it? There was one of the... the was it Perry or, or, or that was the, the critic that read Freudian stuff into everything? I remember this being a real kind of uh, diner a number of years ago. And I kind of, at the time, I, I largely agreed. But also, it is interesting sometimes to start reading other stuff on. And some of the stuff is very clearly there. And you just, it's trying to work out where the limit is. You know, if you I, could I have think filmed... that, Yeah, I think that could have been Robin Wood. I don't remember Peary doing that. Robin I, Wood did it a lot with the anuses in Hitchcock and all that, yeah. I can't even recall. Um, so let's see, Quiet Thunder says Mina's journey is essentially a sexual awakening, which I think we talked about. Andy Ellis says, I think it was Christopher Frayling who said Van Helsing was a sort of marriage guidance counsellor for the Homewoods, getting Mina to recognise the error of her ways. Yeah, um, I think between those last two comments, it is possible that now Mina has become a woman of the world a little bit more. She'll be able to lead Arthur, you know, into a, perhaps a happier relationship. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, Dizzy Yates says he's seen it suggested that Arthur Homewood is impotent. Um, 
So yeah, well, they don't Dar- have any children, do they? We talked about this no. when we were preparing. Well, it doesn't look like he's after any, does he? All appearances is not their child. Yeah. Um, Darren says I agree with David, so I have to read this. Uh, it makes it even more daring <laughs> for the first time where you actually see the teeth penetrate yeah. the neck, even though you see it quickly at the beginning when Jonathan gets bitten. Uh, blah 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 blah. Uh, a Morticia visual says Van Helsing isn't sexless and Bride, though. He's got quite a thing for Marianne. I, I regret to inform you that in the novelization of Brides, there is actually a sex scene between them. And it happens like, I think it's practically like an hour after they've met or something. He's just, just picked her up out of the forest, took them home. Took I'm them disgusted. I'm signing off this conversation. David, <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> In my so mind, he was a terrible novelization. Don't he was a pure that. and holy <laughs> man of God. Who but he's no not. He is not a man of God. He is not a priest. He is not a vicar. He is somebody that knows about the stuff. He's a he's a professor of various things. He's as randy as everyone else. He, I mean, as you, uh, you've already said it. He has presented us as this sort of opposite of of Dracula. He's he's a he's a contrast to him. And one of the things I observed the other night that I posted on Twitter was when you watch Brides of Dracula, he essentially plants hypnotic suggestions into Marianne's head. He tells her like Dracula would do, you are going to tell me everything in great detail and then you are going to forget everything. And as a consequence of this, she ends up shacking up and getting engaged to Baron Meinster, who she already knows has killed his mum. He is Dracula. Do you know that? I find it bizarre, her attraction to David Peel in that. I don't know if Penny has some thoughts on this. Yeah. What's going on there? Because she like she runs into his arms when she knows nothing about him and I mean, it is weird. I, I think, I mean, as we know, like this film had a lot of rewrites, and I think probably that's what is is under all this. But I, I know I was watching it carefully this time for that stuff, and um, I realised that she she knows that the Baroness is dead, so it is a bit weird that her face registers surprise when Peel turns up, like um, the Baron turns up at the um, ladies' school and says his mother's dead. She shouldn't look surprised at that time, but. Actually, what she says when she sees that the Baroness is dead is she looks at, um, is it Greta or Gerda? I get them mixed up. It's That's Greta, Greta, isn't Greta, it? Greta or Greta. Greta, yeah. She looks at her and she says, oh, what have you done? So she doesn't actually realise, I think, at that point that it's the Baron who killed his mother. She's so confused. I think she she genuinely thinks Greta might have done it. And Greta's there, kind of cackling wildly and clearly mad. So it's not an unreasonable conclusion to draw. And then she runs away before the Baron comes back in. So I think it's just about plausible that she didn't quite really realise the full extent of what had happened up at the castle. And that's why she's willing to get engaged to him. But I agree, it's... It doesn't really add up. Yeah, the whole thing is very, um, yeah. And just going back, just this is just an aside, doesn't have direct bearing on our conversation really, but going back to what Robert said about the, you know, Van Helsing's character, is it Brides where he, he rattles through all the all the things that he, or someone rattles through all the all his qualifications and... Yeah, it, it's, it's Brides it's whenever he's confronting right, the teacher. Yeah. yeah, You know, that he's a, to make, uh, which makes it clear that he's, a, you know, he's both, he's a he's a professor of metaphysics, professor of medicine. Oh. It's just a, a little yeah. reminder of, of the very attractive David Peel um, uh-huh. and uh, Yvonne Monleur. Equally attractive Yvonne Monleur. Absolutely. So, I mean, well, well, can we talk a little bit about the glamour of the men? And particularly the, 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 the vampires, because I find it rather interesting that... I mean, David Peel, we know, as far as I'm aware, was a gay man. He had a poodle. (laughs) I mean, that's not a euphemism. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But but then in Kiss of the Vampire, we've got Noel Woolman. And as far as I can tell, Noel Woolman is also a gay actor. Um, He's a Northern Irishman, so, you know, obviously... could they at the time? So I guess that's why we're unclear. They had to be, it was literally illegal at this time. So they couldn't. Although some, I, I, I don't, I, you know, some, some actors were very much out in their circles. I've been oh. doing some research on Harold Lang, who was a character actor that probably most people couldn't picture him that, now that I name him. But actually he was in quite a few Hammer films and an awful lot of, of other films around, around that time. He died quite young in 1970. Uh, he was in Paranoiac. He was in Quite a Mass Experiment. Uh, he was in some Amicus films and stuff like that. And and from what I was reading, Harold Lang was like absolutely everyone knew he was gay, and he was you know he was mm. very open about it. Uh, but I guess I mean that's within a limited circle. So I don't know about 
um, David Peel and Noel Willman. What I find interesting um, about, you know, they've given David Peel this, you know, hairdo that's clearly supposed to, I think, is, is sort of quite fashionable for the sort of late 50s when it was made. Um, I, th I think it was made in about 1959 or possibly just into 1960. So he's got this kind of bouffant hairdo that's quite over the top and you're not, I'm not quite sure if that's accurate to the to the time of uh, the, the setting of the of the film. Uh, but then also um Noel Willman has this thing going on as well, which I find weird because to me that also looks like an attempt to be a bit fashionable. Um but he's just not a I don't imagine he's the sort of actor that many women would, no matter how attractively you presented him. Um, would sort of fawn over. I certainly don't find him very attractive. Um, but he has that he has that ridiculously high hair. Folks in the chat, I mean, if any of you would like to 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 shout out in Noel yep. Woman's favour, please feel free to do Noel so. Willman Darren Bufoy has yeah. sa has said that David Peel was gorgeous and he was absolutely excellent as the Baron. You felt his yeah. power and magnetism, also his evil. Um, Mother, let, let come me just here. <laughs> it reminds me of a friend of. <laughs> <laughs> it's just even worse. Um, so, well, what, a friend of Dorothy, did you say? Yeah, well, yeah, he was actually a friend of Dorothy, but that's <laughs> in there. Um, so we see who else we got here. Joy Robinson says the closest Van Helsing gets to sex is when Baron Meinster bites him, which is interesting. Indeed. We'll talk about that in a second. Is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the prelude Matt, of evolving chains and choking. <laughs> Matt Gemmell is, is, is combining what we know about Van Helsing as a character and the actor's private life and pointing out that Cushing had plenty of sex. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, which is, is well known. And if you don't know this, oh my gosh, go and look at the Hammer Lovers, and Matt will entertain it so for about two have. minutes. Um, Matt, he... Matt, are you saying Peter Cushing was not a saint? <laughs> this, <laughs> is, this, this is news to me that you had an opinion on this. Let's, let's not go into this, please, for the love of God. <laughs> Morticia Visual says Mariana's thinking of what she can inherit: castle, jewels, tile. Yes, this is why. I think she is. I think um, actually that might even explain her fate when she registers surprise about the Baroness being dead. I think what she might actually be thinking is, oh, <laughs> there's an opportunity here. But but in contrast to that, you've got Quiet Thunder films, and Marianne's also seemingly a little dense, finer character, really frustrating yeah. in this regard. And sadly, the only thing that mars yeah. at the film for him uh, can even forgive the Quiet I said him. I'm assuming Quiet Thunder films is a him. It could be a, a she or a they. So apologies if I've misgendered you. Um, yes, so... Uh, I, I don't know because there is that conversation between her and Andre Mele's character uh -huh. where they talk about you get this distinct impression oh, that oh my gosh it's about wealth to be a baroness yeah. yeah yeah somebody mentioned class earlier yeah you can imagine that's a step up for somebody who's come to be a teacher at a girls school but then it's also i get the impression that these people are people that come from a certain kind of background in order to do the teaching in the first place mm -hmm. there's a oh, line yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah. That, that sort of alludes to that mm -hmm. um so I, I don't know, but I, I find that like she seems convincing in her attraction to David Peel's character, to the Baron, for me. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, there's a nice embrace that the two of them have. And then by the end of the film, she's thoroughly embracing Van Helsing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she's not fussy about which man she ends up with. And there is potential for her not just to have whatever man she wants, but some of the ladies would quite welcome her on board she, yeah. you know, too there there is that line and i, I think penny and i both picked this up yeah, this yeah. week about um if you know we can share him together yeah a, a, a menage a, a, not even a menage as well it's like a, it's, it's a proper a, thruple that's being pronounced polyamory yeah polyamorous relationship that she's offering yeah well inter interest on. yeah interestingly there's also you know there's a a suggestion of some quite queer goings on in the household as it is before that with with peel and his mother and yeah. then the relationship and of, of Greta, the, the yeah. housekeeper yeah. Uh, penny would you like to say more about that because you you had a yes. comparison to another great um yes i do, figure of I do think cinema. um greta has a little touch of mrs danvers about her from rebecca obviously the baroness is still alive so which is the um, head of the household that she's so devoted to. But I think Marianne is a little bit in the role of the of the new wife coming into the household. Greta is a bit kind of hostile and, and mean with her. And there is there is a scene when they're sitting around the table um, and the Baroness is explaining all her trauma with her um, son that she's got locked away in the attic and everything or in the, in the room behind the fireplace. Um, 
the Baroness reaches out and kind of grasps Greta's hand and then Greta puts her hand back over the Baroness as well. So there is perhaps that sort of vibe of um, an older lesbian couple going on there. Certainly the Baroness is being left all alone. Her husband's dead. She's had to kind of take on that role, you know, as the head of the household. Um, I think there's actually quite a lot of that sort of, she's sort of ambiguously gendered. I think it might've been one of you that was saying on, on Twitter about her makeup. It's almost a little bit drag queen as yeah. well. She, she's like a panto character. I was, yeah. noticed that today when I was watching her. She's like a pantomime dame. Yeah, it's she's, outrageous. She's, she's very hard. It's all those things. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of playing around. And it's all, it's all to do with the um, sort of layers of um, deception that's meant to be. And, and the viewers, I think probably, I think you said this, Robert, uh, in your in your thread about it. I'm sure we're meant to think at first that she's the vampire mm-hmm. and that her son is is the sad victim being locked up by her. So only Marianne is meant to think that bit about him being the victim. Well, it's, be- it's because of the way that the vampires seem to be introduced in the Hammer in the Hammer vampire films is that they are always introduced in shadow and then they come into the light and i find the same thing whenever clove comes into dr- yeah. to, to prince of darkness is i was convinced when i first watched that that, that clove was dracula until the point where dracula is reanimated um because of the way that he is presented i i literally because i watched that when i was i guess it was the bbc season to celebrate the hammer anniversary in 1987 and when i saw that scene for the first time with clove i assumed being only probably like nine or ten at the time, I assumed that it was Christopher Lee, and I just, yeah. you know, maybe he'd gotten a bit older, or because oh, because I did think it, yeah, I think you were meant to think it was Dracula. Oh, you were really meant to find him creepy, and the way you as, Percy, his shadow, he's not just in shadow. That's the very first thing. Exactly, just his shadow. Um, yeah, which yeah. again is sort of code for a vampire, like like Christopher Lee coming down into the crypt, and you see his shadow going down the stair rails. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to pick up on a few. There's a bunch of comments here, so give me a second, folks. If you're happy enough to stick with us, it's a quarter past nine now here in the here in the UK. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I knew this is why I limited us because I knew we would do far too much. Um, so folks, we're gonna keep on chatting for a bit. Uh, we haven't discussed our end time, but mm-hmm. you know we'll, we'll definitely be done within the next forty five minutes. I would think for everyone's sanity. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do want to pick up on some of the comments as well. So, um. So lots of stuff about David Peel and the Baron. Um, Matt Gemmell's point out Brides doesn't really hold up the scrutiny, especially the, 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 the so basically the plot to mess. We all know this. More than I've given it credit for on this watch. Like it's there's a couple of funny slips, but it's pretty solid. No, it's not. It's not that bad. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Holger it sits with Matt. Doesn't like it as much as some of the others. Uh, Darren Bafoy says Martita Hunt was also magnetic as the Baroness. She was very suitably intimidating. I didn't really know a lot about her as an actress until I saw Brides. Uh, Joy Robinson says Brides is the gayest Dracula film, yeah. and for that we I love it. We should say more about that. There's more to say, but let's go through the others first. <laughs> yeah, we're, we are definitely going to come back to the gayness of Brides, okay? Um, so uh, Morticia says a teacher may be an, an analogous to a governess, not as low as a servant, yeah. but not as high as the family they work She's for. Right. Um, dun, 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 dun. Uh, Joy says this movie has everything sex, poly- polyamory, incest, BDSM, and everybody's queer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I said we weren't going to do Queer Hammer tonight, but I think we're going to do Queer Hammer tonight as well. Can we, I, I think we said, I, go on, sorry, go on. Well, I, yeah, I think we said this at the beginning that basically the queer and the female stuff overlaps here, it's impossible to pick them apart. I mean, but is is that in itself not also part of the way that these films are marketed? So, like, my understanding has always been, rightly or wrongly, that the idea of the heterosexual male gaze will accept lesbianism in a way that it will not accept Mm. David and I having it away. Just, just to put some ideas. In Sorry, I head. just woke up. <laughs> I, 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 you know, there's, there's, there's folks in the, in the in the thread here who are kind of pitching all this stuff, and then they're going, "Oh no, two blokes, no, no." You know, I mean, that, that video was manipulated. Yeah. Can I just get in that first? <laughs> you did, darling. Didn't? Yeah, um, I, think, I think you're right. There's definitely a kind of no homo rule. Um, yeah. In fact, it's broken half the time, and we can talk about that as well. It is. But we do have to go back to the literal political context it was literally illegal at this time so it, it isn't just about straight men's 
preferences, it is that as well. That they, they, there were just limits to what they could show from that perspective. But but even within that, I mean, so we've got this this potential. So Valerie Gaunt potentially is the one that first bites Van Helsing, mm -hmm. or no, mm -hmm. first bites Jonathan Harker, we're, we're, and then yeah. Dracula does, but we don't see it. But yeah. Brides of Dracula throws that out the window, and it goes, yeah. "Do you know what? We're going to start a cycle where we can see people being bitten, and then sort of turning away from that." There's a cycle then of, of incidents where people are burning themselves in order to stop the contagion of the vampirism. Yes, at least three. Well, yeah, the, the other three films that we cover all have that. Yeah. But but I mean, for me, that that's a hugely BDSM sequence where you've got David yes. David Baron Meister is throwing literally the chains around the place. Then he has a bit of auto asphyxiation erotica with 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 Van Helsing. Van Helsing is sort of semi conscious, and in a kind of rapey scenario, uh, he bites or penetrates to 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 invoke Holger um to you know and 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 Van Helsing is potentially on the turn and it's and Gina and Ella uh, the village girl are like watching this with rapt eagerly. attention oh. from, from the stairs it, the the women in these films are always so turned on when they're watching the yeah. the you know the well whether it's the act of vampirism or as we might get on to later if we get this far whether you know Marion being sort of seduced, hypnotized at the piano or whatever, yeah, yeah. I, I, the the way the other women look on is just they're, they're so turned on. Well, that that, uh, that wasn't a um, that wasn't a cue to get to move on to Kiss of the Vampire because I think we no 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 we're quite interesting. Out, we're, right. rides, yeah. Yeah. we're not we're not done with this yet. Um, I I want to ask then that, that let's take this if we take ourselves as viewers of these films. And having laid out our, our sexuality at the start of this conversation, in terms of how we respond to this, in terms of, of, of glamour, I mean, what, 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 how, how do we feel about this? I mean, if this is meant to be the thing that, that is there to excite the streets and, and the men, the straight men specifically, I'm, I'm really interested to see where you come at it from, a, from Penny, from a woman's perspective and, and David just as a gay man watching sure. this with a, with a gay lead. Yeah. Well, can I just go straight to Gina and Marianne? Please and do. That scene and all the lesbian connotations that Terence Fisher told her to play up. Because, um, so on one level, you know, she's saying all these things like, my darling Marianne, you know, I want to kiss you, Marianne, and we can both love him, and all it's got those lesbian and polyamorous connotations. And on the one hand, you could go, okay, that's, I'm just sure, like primarily, it's there to be under that cloak of plausible deniability to titillate the men. But it, as I said earlier on, right when we were introducing all this stuff, it is there, so that's so nice for a queer female viewer. But another thing that I think is important to say about that and that character is, and again, this kind of comes from a sort of sexist place in a way, but she is. Almost the only character I can think of in these films of this type at this time that we never see her punished for that. Almost all of these transgressive women end up punished, but Gina just disappears at the end of the film. She and the other girl sort of run off into a room at the back of the mill, and then Van Helsing and Marianne run out through the same room, and they they're not they aren't there. There's no sign of them. They've gone, so we assume they escape. And what I mean by saying that probably comes from a place of sexism is basically probably what must have happened there is just nobody on the script or production team was bothered to write a resolution for them. There they are. Um, so it's kind of a mistake that they get to escape having expressed queer female desire and everything. But that's exactly the kind of thing that I was saying right at the beginning that can be really fun for viewers like me, because that leaves the door wide open. You can write your own fanfic, you know, to follow on from this about the lesbian <laughs> vampire coven that they form, you know. So that's brilliant. I really like that. That's one of my favourite things about this film, their escape and the, the unwritten sequel. It's the sequel we should have had, isn't it? I mean, I would I would have watched that. It is actually pretty much how uh, Dracula in India would have ended. Ah. There we go. David. Sorry, I'm just, I keep getting getting sight of Matt's comments and I never know quite what he's referring to. You made a hilarious <laughs> one before about, um, he, he said, and you, and you can analyze the subtext for yourself to know what he means. He <laughs> said, he said, Peel, yes. Noel Willman, no, not even with yours. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, well, the thing is, Noel Willman 
I, I think he's quite in the reptile. He's quite, um, you know, he looks quite distinguished and mm. just a, a bit more presentable because he's just got, I think it's still a wig, but you know, it's a bit more tame, but yeah, not in um, Kiss of the Vampire. Mm. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, the Brides of Dracula. Um, so from the queer perspective, now I find that in the in the fifties and sixties, the the way gay men were treated on film was was much more sympathetic than I think in the nineteen seventies. Certainly in Hammer, um, and perhaps this was a reaction to it becoming legal mm. and and gay men being more out out and proud is actually quite vicious. Like in so in the nineteen seventies, you get for example two examples that stand out for me are the, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, the people in like a mental asylum that like warders or whatever, or mm. uh, or there's a, you know, like nurses or something. In both Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell and in Blood from the Mummy's Tomb, you get what for me are very sort of heavily coded gay sadistic um, wardens or warders who are, um, yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just vicious. They're bitchy. And that's that's kind of how their gayness is portrayed. But early earlier on in films generally, but also in Hammer films, it's it's kind of more sympathetic, I think, the way gay characters are, are treated. In in the Brides of Dracula, I, I mean, one thing I find really interesting about it, which no one said explicitly yet, is how the 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 first half hour of the film, well, the first fifteen minutes is almost exclusively all all revolves around women. Mm. Um, I mean, you do get, you get like the coach driver and uh, the funny guy who's not, you know, was in the script and then not in the script and then, you know, and what the hell's he doing? Latour, I think his name is. Uh, and you get the innkeeper, but they're all, you know, fairly marginal characters, but all the main characters are women. And it's, it's 15 minutes before David Peel appears. And then it's a whole half an hour before Van Helsing appears. Um, so it all revolves very much um, around women. And then when um, you get David Peel, and um, he does very much fit the, as I, as I think one of you in conversation this week said, or you might have been tweeting about it, he does fit the, the image of the, the gay son who's kind of locked away. Um, his mother, even though I, I, I've always read her as kind of lesbian, she is very butch, um, you know, the way she, the way she, she reminds me. And again, one of you think said this earlier in the week, she reminds me of um, Dracula's daughter, which was also an extremely queer film in a way that you wonder how it got past the censors in 1936, or was that before the Hayes code and all that? I can't remember. Um, but yeah, she's, she's, she comes across as very butch. She appears and then she's like enticing Marianne into her company. And she's like, oh, I often long, I, I often long for the, for the company of someone with a little breeding. Um, and then, and then you get the, the, the dining scene where um, the, the bitchy um, housekeeper is sort of looking on from behind watching her interactions with Marianne. And, um, and she has that wonderful line where, uh, where she says, um, Oh, where is it? I wrote it down. She says, like, oh, you, you would not believe it. We had we once had gay times here. Balls, laughter, life. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so the whole thing is just so queer. And apparently, just as an aside, um the, the word balls was improvised. I always get such a laugh out of that. Um, I think she they were rehearsing and they she fluffed her lines. This is how the story goes. Anyway, she fluffed her lines and said balls and then said, can I keep that in? Um, which which I, I can believe because it always sounds to me like that was deliberate. You know, they, they were trying to ramp up the camp and the humour um, with that line. Um, uh, but then the way she talks about her, her son, he's, he's got this backstory where she sort of blames, blames herself for his condition. Um, she almost... There's almost a hint of, well, there are more than a hint of abuse, either from someone else mm. that she overlooked because she, uh, she says, I, I laughed at, at their wicked games until they took him. And 
I mean, the mind boggles because I'm like, what wicked games? And she's talking about she's talking about the Baron Meinster when he was either a young man or a child, and someone's playing games with him, and she's laughing. She's laughing until they finally take him, and that's like vampire circus levels of creepy. Uh, but actually, it ties in with the first film. Just to go back to something I was sort of researching, I read a, I read a paper on this about the blue for lady in uh, in in the original novel of Dracula, and uh, Jimmy Sangster kind of takes that idea of the blue for lady. That's the beautiful lady. Um, it, he, he takes that idea and uses it for um, for Lucy in in the Hammer film Dracula, nineteen fifty eight, as this this idea of a a, a woman vampire mm. who preys on children. Um, which is very kind of uncomfortable because we, we, you know, we know that vampirism is primarily sexual, and there she is enticing um, Tanya. Um, but also, it, this idea of the blue for lady uh, in in the nineteenth century, uh, you would get uh, attractive young women preying upon children, being used to entice children so that they could then be abused by, by men. Uh, and, and this is where the concept of the blue, for, and there's a, I'll have to, I'll have to send it around to anyone who's interested the, yeah. the paper on this. Um, it is a le- legit thing that was going on at that time as these young women um, playing games with children. And then a bit like, if you think Oliver Twist, Nancy lure uh, being used to lure in the children for Fagin. Um and and this is almost a suggestion you get in Brides of Dracula, with this idea of the Baron being quite young and playing these wicked games, and then all of a sudden they take him, it goes too far, and the mother's looking on, and she's laughing at their wicked games. I, do you know, I didn't even pick up, I've, I've realised since I've started watching Hammer films even more often than I used to, and often watching them for different things, I've noticed how much you can miss Mm. even in the dialogue in terms of backstory and little references here and there. And I get this feeling that, you know, the mother blames herself for the son's homosexuality, which is an age old thing in not just in literature and film, but I mean, I used to be a fundamentalist Pentecostal and this was the whole basis of sort of reparative or conversion therapy was the idea of, you know, if you have an overbearing mother who, you know, modelly coddles you too much, then that's what makes you gay. And so, you know, have therapy and and you'll be straight again, as God intended. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I do get that impression that it's, it's, it's very easy to read the, the Baron as the gay son being locked away. And then there's more of that. I know we're not moving on to Kiss of the Vampire yet, or maybe not at all tonight, depending how <laughs> this goes. There's a, the same sort of ideas present in Kiss of the Vampire. Mm. Um where it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of this hedonistic, um, licentious cult of people um, playing around and luring, luring children in. Um, and something I just realised what rewatching a few scenes tonight is that you have the little girl Tanya in Dracula, and then you have the slightly older girl Tanya in um, in The Kiss of the Vampire, who actually, because she's depicted as being uh, you see her confirmation picture and they say she's 14. She's clearly a bit, looks a bit, quite a bit older than that to me. I don't know how old mm. Isabel Black was at that time. Um, I don't know, eight, 18, 19, older. I don't know. Um, but she seems to have been, yeah, she could almost be continuous with that character of Tanya. Obviously she isn't because, you know, Ger- unless Gerda was the housekeeper who then went and got married and opened a hotel no, in no, no, the no, area. No, no. And, but yeah. Anyway, I'll shut up because I've been going on for ages. Oh, he does, doesn't he? So. <laughs> like no right reply. Fuck off. <laughs> I think you're right, though, David. And actually, to kind of back up what you say, what we actually see the Baroness doing in brides is literally procuring young women for the Baron. So she's continuing the same behaviour. I think you're right. It's what she's been doing for a long time. 
the, there's a whole incestuous line though with the Baron and the Baroness as mm. well. And I mean, I don't, sure. I don't know how far either of you agree with me in that that is something that that's there. But if we take the the vampiric bite, the kiss of the vampire, as as being not just a a, a literally having your neck bit, but as part of a, a sexual act, as a, I mean, I I was just assuming there's intercourse that is accompanied with it, particularly when you look at, at, at those scenes with Mina, um, the Baron wicked little boy that he is turns his ma you know in the process of this and i i kind of feel that that quite potentially there's this sort of incestuous line that's been running anyway and when she's laughing and engaging in this these games she's a participant is the impression that i get it's just that at some point a line was crossed and i think she was a my my interpretation is that she was okay with everything up until the point where he became a vampire um, so every other kind of hedonism was okay, except that she's she didn't kill him then either. She 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 has continued to protect him, but just felt bad about it and procured these young women for him. But no, you're right. Yeah, yeah I agree. There's that. Yeah, there's something very dodgy going on there, and the, and the way he talks to his mother. I love the bit where he's at the bottom of the stairs and she's at the top of the stairs, and it's it's very psycho. Even though they were released, I'm sure there's no. A little bit like the birds and kiss of the vampire, where they're often compared for various reasons. Brides of Dracula and Psycho have that a similar dynamic going on, but I don't think there's any influence one on the other. If there was, it would be Hitchcock on on Hammer, I'm sure. Um, but the way he said, "Mother, come here," it's so bloody gay, but it's also like the command he just. It's almost like, oh, you know, he just has to put on the voice and she knows what he means. It's it's all very creepy and there's, there's something so dysfunctional in that relationship. And, yeah, it's very easy to, to read that as, um, you know, there's something incestuous going on. And then she... the way afterwards as well that she's completely absorbed with self-loathing and, and yearning for death. From Van Helsing as well, I and mean, that, that's a fairly obvious reaction to exactly everything that David's just said. Um, it's it's like a uh, Jocasta in Oedipus who hangs herself. It's it's the same kind of urge from the it's, it's Veronica Carlson in Frankenstein must be destroyed. Right. It's 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 the same kind of I've been uh, sexually assaulted, abused, used in a way that I, I wasn't up for, and I, I can't live with myself. It's, it's sort of high take. There's a whole bunch of comments, so let me just sort of sure. incorporate some of these as well. Um, so Joy, uh, Joy Robinson has said the triumph of the heterosexual patriarchy at the end of the films is, I think, what allows these films to get away with these transgressive themes. Just saying that Brides definitely leads to a reading of Van Helsing as a repressed queer man who's overcompensating by violently upholding heteropatriarchy. Um, let me see what else. Uh, Darren says it's all very sexual. A dark predator coming into your room at night, penetrating your neck with their teeth, and then sucking and drawing the blood from you. Anne Rice touched on this even more with her Vampire Chronicles. Um, that's yeah, that's not vampirism. That's just grinder, isn't it? <laughs> no. Go on. <laughs> you, you're on the ale again tonight. <laughs> um, Darren's also uh, says he's enjoying the chat as well. He says it's a brilliant one. Uh, some great observations for everyone. Thanks, guys. Uh, Matt agrees with you. He says the guys are definitely gay and very badly drawn. Um, and Morticia says the Baroness always strikes me as a very lonely character. She's intimately connected with Greta in terms of what Greta knows about the family, but Greta is not her social or intellectual equal. I think Greta's a really curious character. Um, that she, she strikes me as having a lot of the power within that dynamic as well. She'd, I was watching this scene uh, this afternoon, and it's it's the scene where um, Marianne says, "Oh, you said you said we were alone here. There were no there, there were no men, but I'm sure I just saw a young man on the balcony." And <laughs> I, I rewound it about ten times because Frida Jackson's reaction was so hilarious. The way she just she just sort of rolls her eyes and mm's. but. <laughs> I, I, I won't even try to imitate it, but watch that scene and rewind it a couple of times because it's hilarious. And it's such, it's, it's, it, this, it's so layered. Part of it is like she resents the hell out of the fact that she has to share a house with this male who's getting in between her and, and the Baroness. And then part of it is, is also just, as I think Penny just said, her, or 
who had, someone just said about the amount of power she has in the household. I, she really has a lot of power in that scene because she's just like, I'm not even going to give a fuck about this. I'm just going to roll my eyes and say, and that's that's the impression she gives off. And it's like, Marianne, I mean, Marianne, she's almost gaslighting Marianne because Marianne has clearly just seen David Peel on the balcony. She's had this conversation with him. And then she's like, I could have sworn I just, did I, did I imagine it or did I see a man on the balcony? And, um, and Frida Jackson's just like, mm, yeah. And? <laughs> Well, speaking of gaslighting, let's move this conversation on a little bit more because we've got about, uh, let's say, our 20 minutes or so. Uh, Kiss of the Vampire includes a very, very clear gaslighting episode in terms of what happens to the lovely Edward D'Souza. Uh, it's, it's, it's Gerald, isn't it? Um, I'm wondering if I got the right names in my head. Uh, who is led to believe that the events that he has witnessed at a party didn't actually happen and he has no wife at all, which, you know, it's, it's, some men might say that's a blessing. I don't know. Um, but Kiss of the Vampire is another one of those sort of fascinating films, and it seems to build up on a lot of what we've been doing over the last two. And it, it I'm not going to say that it ups the kink. I think that actually it, it doesn't really up the kinky elements of it, but there's still a lot of stuff going on, and there's still, for me, I feel there's a huge incestuous vibe to it. Mm. Um, Between the Ravner siblings? Or... I, yeah. I mean, quite honestly, I think they're all one sort of weird yeah. collective and whilst they bring other people in i think it's even seeing the two of them dance together as brother and sister which is probably a perfectly innocent normal thing to do it still helps to create that kind of vibe and we know that they're part of a vampire cult and we know that vampire cults thanks to brides of dracula are associated with hedonism and wickedness so my brain is already going to to the far depths um but the other thing that I suppose we've got to keep on remembering about is about how this ties in with our idea of, of sort of glamour and what it's doing here with this. And uh, um, it's a, just curious on on any any leading thoughts on this, David or Penny. So to me, this whole film is very much about looking at Marianne. Marianne is just at the centre of everybody's gaze throughout the entire film, to the extent that literally the first time we see her is through Ravner's telescope in the car with Gerald, and then he continues staring at her after um, she goes. And there, there's a lot of, I'll tie it back to the glamour specifically, she's lent that dress um, by Sabina, the Ravner's sister, um, and Sabina is the one, she comes to the ball, she's like, oh, Marianne, let me look at you, and she's dressed up all glamorous and everything. Um, so that's kind of... There's a nice little theme there. It's, uh, we talked earlier about the piano scene and everyone's staring at each other, like Carl is staring at Marianne, Sabina is flicking glances at her, like absolutely everyone can't get enough of Marianne. But so that's nice in itself. And that's, it, I think if I, if I was teaching film, I'd probably take this film as a really good example of the cinematic gaze. Mm. But it isn't just that. It kind of, it all comes out at the end of the film. So what you just said about, Gerald being gaslit, at th that point it sort of turns into a battle about who is going to be allowed to look at Marianne and who she's going to look back at. So at that mm. point, what literally has happened to Gerald is he, he can no longer see her at all. She's totally vanished. And meanwhile, Ravner is totally commanding her. And there's that scene in the tower room where Ravner is like saying to Marianne, oh, don't you want to see your husband? She's like, no, no, I only want to see you. Which all then results. So it's coming out, it's not just what the visuals are doing with her. It's coming right out in the text about looking at Marianne. And then <clears throat> it all it all resolves in the end when she kind of lovingly turns her eyes on Gerald after all the vampires have died. Mm -hmm. So that's like... I, I think I think you said in your Twitter thread, Robert. I think it was you that kind of left you a little bit cold. This film, and I kind of know what you mean. It is it is tamped down a bit to prepare compared to some of the sort of dynamism and sexuality we've seen in the other two. But I thought that that theme of it was actually quite clever and nicely played out. I mean, I I like a lot of the themes that that play within it. I'll get to you in a second, David. Uh, Bursting. Like I, like, I like a lot of the themes that just for me, there's something about, maybe it's just the casting doesn't quite gel for me or it's the direction or something's not quite. Also, I watched an appalling print. Um, Holger has pointed out in the, the sort of the, the noirish elements and uh, references Lady Vanishes. Um, 
as well. I suppose that must be in terms of the the, the gaslighting and the, the the vanishing and the not oh, being yeah, able to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, we we said we said the male. We, you know, we've talked about gaze and, and and sort of vision, but it's it's voyeurism, isn't it? I mean, mm. actually, we open up on an act of voyeurism. So if I I've, having I'm just going to having just said this isn't a very kinky film i'm going to undo that and say actually it's incredibly kinky because we're now dealing with another sexual practice because ultimately voyeurism is intended to lead her into a cult and she is initiated successfully um which presumably means that you know if we take again the kiss of the vampire as a, as a sexual act that she has had congress with the vampires and now only sees them and wants to be part of that that society so she's joined the the, the swingers and the king. someone said to me in response to this the other night on twitter that when you come into that scene, it's like she, they've just stumbled on a bunch of swingers. Mm -hmm. I kind of no. get it. I mean, I, I you know, that there is that kind of vibe that there's, there's something amiss and kinky and, and, and untoward, and they're a bit naive. David? Absolutely. You're right about that. I think because there's, there's a bit of backstory as well in Clifford Evanson, Evans's character, Professor Zimmer. He talks about how his, his daughter went off to the city and you got mixed in with the wrong crowd came back riddled with disease it's clearly it is it, it well it is literally it is a group of swingers that's what that's what it's all about i think um they're just into every kind of perversion possible um and they're not, paying not that, for not it not that with... that's necessarily perverted if you're a swinger folks you know that that's okay oh sorry i'm talking yeah <laughs> i am talking from the perspective of them you know, rolling, i mean yeah, yeah. in the in the, in the world of hammer you know whether it's you know, gay incest swinging, it's all on the same level in, in Hammer. Um, so that's definitely what's going on. Um, just to pick up on Holger's point, um, I think it's a very Hitchcockian film, even from the opening titles, which I, I think are a bit of a nod to Vertigo, mm. when it zooms in on that face, um, not as lovely or as sophisticated as the Vertigo title sequence, but it's very similar imagery. Um, so I don't know, make of that what you will. Um, and then, yeah, I'd, I'd really like Penny's reading of the, of the, um, the gays and the, that's G-A-Z-E, not G-A-Y-S, because there's potential for confusion here. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I think there's a, a really nice contrast with the character of Professor Zimmer, because where all the, all the characters are, or a lot of the characters are all looking uh, at Marianne and directing their gaze towards Marianne. And, uh, and indeed, to use uh, Robert's term, uh, you know, they're voyeurs. On the other hand, Professor Zimmer is watchful, which is a different type of looking. Mm. He always seems to be in the, in the right place at the right time. At the very beginning, he's, he's nowhere to be seen. And then all of a sudden, Marianne needs him. And he's just there in the middle of the road. She bumps into him. It's like he knows. And this is despite we know he's he's a really he's a suffering character. He's in a lot of pain internally. He's he's a drunk. He's an alcoholic. He lives on. Is it brandy and, and brandy sour cream. cream? Yeah. Which, do you know, almost makes me want to try a brandy and sour cream diet. <laughs> I didn't know it was possible to treat sour cream as like a food stuff in and of itself, but I kind of want to try that. And then maybe just, you know, devote the rest of my time to learning occult rituals to fight evil and stuff like that. I, I think he has a quite, for a drunk, he has an attractive life. Um, so yeah, he's very watchful. And then at the end, I think he's exactly the same again. When, when is there a point where he's waiting for, does does Edward D'Souza's character get thrown off a wagon or something and he's waiting for, or am I getting my films mixed up? No, it is because I noticed it was very, very similar to Brides when Van Helsing picks up Marianne in the woods. Uh, yeah, and Dracula, Prince of Darkness as well. Uh, when Prince, yeah. When, yeah. when mm. Father Sandor, Shandor always, is, uh... is waiting, sort of almost waiting for them. Now, and and for me, that uh, Professor Zimmer is just a beautiful character because he's he's looking, but he's not looking in that, lusting voyeuristic sense mm. he's watchful he's actually open to other people's needs and he's compassionate and when he's needed he's there um and he he has uh, uh yeah to me considering he's got all that pain going on with with his own daughter and everything that happened 
I think he's just the most wonderful character that he's still able to retain that alertness to, to other people's needs. Um, yeah, Matt, that, um, really Matt mentions Barry Warren, which I'll, I'll just touch upon um, briefly because I've been doing a bit of research into, into Barry Warren. Um, and, and I've always read him very easily in, in, in fact, in all his Hammer films uh, as, as, as gay. Um, he, he was he was never gay. I've read a little bit. Yeah, we, yeah. There's a lot more to say about Barry Warren, um, but yes, his thing was that he was actually um, he he was actually yeah. As 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 Matt said, he had a sex change later in life, and he was very happy from that point on. Um, he became Claire Warren, um, and it's it's all in. But the only source I know of is Sarah Miles's memoirs, which which I've been reading this week, uh, and she speaks for about two or three pages about um, what happened. And um, yes, for the rest of her life, she was she. She was Claire Claire Warren, and she was great great friends with uh, Robert Bolt as Barry. Robert Bolt being the playwright who wrote Man for All Seasons, who was married to Sarah Miles, uh, and Robert Bolt actually refused to see him after the sex change. And then when they finally did meet, Sarah Miles sort of forced him into it. Um, and then they were the greatest of friends um, for the rest of their lives. Um, I, so I think Barry, who became Claire Warren, she was very, um, she was very happy for that remaining, you know, five, 10 years of her life or whatever it was. Um, and unfortunately she died of cancer relatively young. I think it was about 1990, thereabouts. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd always read Barry Warren's character as gay. Um, it just gives gives me that vibe. But clearly, they're all they're all queer in all kinds of ways mm. in that film. Um, yeah, and I, and I and I do pick up on a sort of a bit of an incestuous vibe between him and his sister as well. Yeah. Um... The sorry, just Matt's point about cult. I'm sure I heard that term in something else, possibly brides. I it's, think that's it's, used. It's definitely used in brides, but I yeah. wonder is it used, if, if Matt's asking, is it used before that? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's in a universal horror somewhere, but I don't know. I would need to oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Holger says, it's probably the Van Helsing become outside of the Dracula Cycle Hammer had some really memorable vampire fighters as well. Um, yeah, and, and Holger's also a massive fan of Kiss, uh, which, is, which is fine. Great band, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I I I do want to kind of. I think we got enough time to talk a little bit about Prince of Darkness as well. You know, I, we're not able Prince to cover in this. Well, we're not able to cover everything about any of these films. That's that's the grim reality of this. And when we're talking about the glamour and 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 everything else, and I think for me, I mean, I, I'll lay my cards on the table. I think for me, I what I find odd about <clears throat> Kiss the Vampire is I don't find the 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 glamour necessarily in our two leads for me it's not edward de souza and jennifer daniels that are that are kind of where my where my gaze is drawn it's the supporting cast um oh this is what i was going to say in terms of glamour this is also sort of fascinating because i when i first did all this hammer stuff many years ago when i was doing my unofficial site um i received an anonymous piece of fan mail once and it included a rather pornographic re-description of the the sequences within Kiss the Vampire within the, the cult. And I've apologized of... for this. We <laughs> drew a line under it at the time. Sorry, go on. But a lot of attention to, you know, the, the like they, they clearly had stopped and paused the, the, the VCR a number of times and you know, great descriptions of the bodies and the underwear and everything else. And I found it a very strange thing at that point, being so young and naive, to receive. But it also now that we're talking about this, it strikes me as as a way that the glamour, the sex appeal, the 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 way that people engage with these films was being manifested through an individual. It's the equivalent, I suppose, of writing a fanfic piece, you know, to to respond to these films, to to engage with our, I suppose, the things that draw us, our desires, the the attractions. Well, that that final scene with the bats is kind of. I mean, it's wonderful, but it's also ridiculous. And you get all these images of women, you know, exposing their panties and rolling around. And 
there's this almost carry on moment where a bat goes down Isabel Black's bra and she's like trying to fish it out. And it, it seems to me so inappropriate in, in terms of it's like a comedy moment in the middle of this quite serious ending. So I can fully understand um, why a red blooded male would want to cause <laughs> those scenes several times. And even um, there was there was some sort of anecdote relayed in one of Wayne Kinsey's books about how the, the sight of a bat bobbing up and down underneath Noel Willman's robes looked like he was having a wank. <laughs> I d- and I couldn't, it's funny because I couldn't work out whether that was when Wayne says, oh, from a distance, it looked like he was having a wank. I couldn't work out if if Wayne had just, that was his own observation or that was actually an anecdote that someone had, you know, that someone had said, oh, and everyone thought it looked like he was having a wank or, or Wayne just thought, Oh, that anecdote sounds like he looked, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a weird one. But it's yeah, it's an odd ending in in that regard. Penny, what do you think about all these ladies in their panties and bats and all? Yeah, that? that's the kind of stuff that I was talking about right at the beginning that I kind of have to watch past, really. To be honest, it's like oh, another sexy corpse. You know, it is. Yeah, I. I'm not thrilled about it, really. Is is that a point at which you disengage, though, from from what you're Can saying? Be, yeah, yeah, it is a little bit. It's distracting, and you're sort of having, you know, sort of cynical thoughts about, oh, they'll they'll all be glad they listen to their grandmas and put on fresh underwear that day, and it just it does it does pull you out the story a bit. It's it is. <laughs> uh, the more I think about it, the more it's it's quite carry on, which yeah. which um, you know, Alan Hume. Um, photograph this at the last minute he wasn't supposed to I think it was supposed to be Arthur Grant or something was supposed to be lighting Um, and whoever it was was indisposed and Alan Hume came on board and he did a fantastic job because it's so beautifully lit that whole film Uh, and he also lit a lot of the carry-ons including carry-on screaming I think Kiss of the Vampire was probably a a dry run for carry-on screaming Um, but it is very much you know all these carry-on films that end with like a custard pie fight or um there's that one of my favorites is carry on behind where they all they're all in the club and they're sitting on chairs that have been recently been painted and they all get up and you get all these close-ups of like oh look there's someone's bum with paint on it oh look there's someone's you know someone's trousers just fell down and it's a little bit like that at the end of kiss of the vampire it's like a carry on ending with oh look you know a bat just attacked someone's panties oh look it just went down this this woman's big boobies um yeah, it's kind of hilarious and weird, but I do love that ending, actually. Um, Matt Gemmel, uh, notorious heterosexual, uh, says that the real glamour is with Isabel Black. She effortlessly exudes sex appeal. And um, i, I, I got to be honest, I spend more time watching Isabel than I do anyone else on that screen. Apart from Clifford Evans, who I think is is pretty fabulous. Um well, there's the great scene in the graveyard where she bites him and then she laughs. I think that was a really great sort of transgressive woman moment. But it, it strikes me as odd because I think there is this sort of uh, perception that the hammer glamour is about the leading ladies. But we also know from all those endless publicity photographs that they would get an actress and put her into a bit part maybe get her to take her top off if it was the 70s and they could use that stuff to exploit the movies and the titillation of the audiences even if they had no lines and nothing really functional to do within the plot isn't that um, what marie Devereaux literally said about herself in relation to brides that she would be put in it because she has a large chest and then that could be on the poster yeah which is is, is kind of depressing but it also strikes me that every now and then it strikes me that there's two things at work you know there's our perception of what hammer glamour is and then there's this other stuff that's going on and then as you said at the very start it's not just about the sex appeal of the women i mean we haven't even got into the really into the discussion of the men tonight and i know from i had a look through our, our through twitter to see what what come up when i look at hammer glamour and we've had a little bit of a chat before about oliver reed's nipples and and things like that about the importance of the men it's within tasteless. the glamour <laughs> you know um but it is those other things. It's not just about the women. It's about the way that they're dressed. It's about the way that everything looks. It's about the opulence of this. It's about an aesthetic, which I've, I I kind of assume, rightly or wrongly, is a lot of the attraction, particularly to younger people, 
is, is isn't just about this. It's, there is this sort of aesthetic. I mean, as, as a sort of quasi recovering goth myself, um, the aesthetic was a huge part of it. That that's why I got drawn to these films and not to I mean why I, I wasn't so interested in other horror films. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's Bernard Robinson doing the glamour, isn't it, as much as anybody else, and Jack Asher and, and so on. I, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, yeah. David? He's got nothing to say, that's unusual. He's just kept himself muted because he knows he has nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in that case, I'll just pick up. Quiet, Thun Quiet Thunder says he agrees. He says the leads are rather twee, dull, and kiss. Black and Warren bring the sex. Evans the presence. Glad Warren find peace in later life I too. I do. Um, of course, you yeah. There is actually it. there is an explanation for those leads in in Kiss um, because I was reading about this recently. I think it was in an interview in Little Shop of Horrors, maybe. And um, and Don Sharp, who was the director, that was his decision. He he didn't want stars because mm -hmm. he was. He's very used to work, working with classically trained actors, and I guess Jennifer Daniel and uh, Cliff, uh, uh, Clifford Edward Evans and, and Noel Willman and uh, Edward D'Souza, yeah, um, came from that sort of theatrical background, which not all Hammer actors did. I know Cushing, Cushing did a little bit, I think. Hmm. Uh, Christopher Lee didn't really. He came from Rank, didn't he, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a conscious decision on Don Sharp's part that no no I, I don't care if you know christopher lee or peter cushing or one of the big you know one of the big stars is in it i, I want these you know edward de souza blah 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 um because they're classically trained actors and obviously from some of your point of views that's that backfired i've always found them quite insipid but i've not i've not that's never bothered me particularly um i mean i find edward de souza i like but i don't don't particularly rate him um he's in phantom of the opera as well isn't he and mm -hmm. that's yeah i find him sort of about equally in indifferent to him in that really i like, quite I, like jennifer daniel i hope he not watching a, this <laughs> a decent sort of chemistry with jennifer daniels like they're believable as a couple and you know yes yeah. which they need to be for the story to work Absolutely, yeah. and I mean, down to the to the point where you know he's he's being almost led astray in in the party and, mm. and enjoying it, and and you know he's not looking for her because he's I don't know they feel kind of genuine. Um, yeah. I, I wonder if she's yeah. Obviously, he doesn't have a, a Michael Goff problem where he's because they do get quite horny, don't they, when they're in the hotel room? Oh yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's um, so he doesn't have Congress. he does so he doesn't have that. Uh, he doesn't have that problem, but all the same, it's it's suspicious how at the party all Barry Warren has to do is put on a mask, uh, and all of a sudden she's like, you know, she's obviously not even clocked their difference in body types she's or body language or yeah, yeah. That's probably There's it. a lot of drink, I think. That's but it's only... but possibly she's already very much under the spell of this weird Ravner family, um, and also. Uh, perhaps like like Melissa Stribling or Mina Holmwood in the original Dracula, you know, underneath she's really actually quite willing to surrender and go running after these unusual pleasures. Let me just comment a couple of last little comments and then I think we're going to wrap this up because we've been here for a couple of hours and I'm sure if we want to get to other things, okay. including, including my panelists. Um, so, uh, Quiet Thunder says, the, uh, so we've done that one, uh, Morticia asks, I wonder if our reaction to it now was similar to the audience reaction at the time, which is always a good question. Um, and Holger says, wasn't it that some of the other bigger Hammer stars at the time were engaged in other Hammer movies, or is he mixing his films and time periods? I think David sort of explained that one. Um, also, well, also, I'm, I'm not sure, because they didn't tend in that era anyway to be making multiple films at the same time, because mm. they were mostly making films at Bray, which could only have one production at a time. So I'd, so I don't think, I think as they got towards the mid sixties, they expanded a bit because they had, they'd have a bit going on at different studios maybe, but yeah, I don't think that was an issue at that time. Um, Christopher Lee had just gone to, um, recently gone to Europe because, yeah. uh, because he wanted to do Phantom of the Opera, but mm. by the time they made it, because like I could have been a contender, I could have been oh. somebody, could have been an opera singer. Um, could have but yeah, but by, <laughs> by the time they actually made the film, he he was off in Europe, getting married and having a family, and 
all that, yeah. So look, we we didn't get round to uh, we didn't get beyond Kiss the Vampire really tonight. Um, if folks that who are watching are happy to come back to us at another occasion, we will continue our, our discussion about the Beyond Hammer Glamour, and we'll pick up with Dracula the Prince of Darkness and work our way through the rest of the vampire cycle. That's assuming that Penny and David are both happy to chat with me again. I'm game. I'd, I'd, I'm game as well, <laughs> and also I'm I'm up for another chat. Excellent. Um, I just want to thank uh, everybody for for taking part tonight. For those of you who've, who've engaged with us, who've been chatting through on on, on the chat. Um, in terms of where you can find everybody, uh, Penny, you're on Twitter. I am. My username is PJ Goodman. Just all no dots or underscores or anything. Just all one word. And nothing you want to plug? Uh, no, not really. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, David. You can find me at davidlradigan.com, twitter.com slash hammergothic. There is a Facebook page as well, search hammergothic, but to be honest, I don't really update it. It doesn't get much interaction because I don't do much there. It's mostly just so I have a Facebook presence and can plug the occasional event. And the article that I uh, referred to earlier is coming up in the next edition of We Belong Dead. Well, it might not be the next edition. It's the anniversary edition because We Belong Dead is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And I've written a few thousand words on Dracula 1958, which is my favourite horror film of all time. Um, so you can hear me uh, or read me elaborating on some of the thoughts I shared tonight. Um, yeah. Uh, Penny, do you have something else you want to say there? That was it. That was it. Uh, and, and to me, David. Uh, you'll, you'll find me at uh, Avalard, A-V-A-L-L. A-V-A-L-A-R-D or at Exclusive PhD on Twitter. Um, you'll also find me as Robert J. E. Simpson on various places. And uh, this has been a, a Cinepunk presentation, cinepunk.com. Uh, we do do live events. We do these sort of live streams. And there's also a podcast. And occasionally David pops up on that as well. Um, so do tune in for things. And uh, if you have enjoyed this, hit the subscribe button on the channel, follow us on our Twitter profiles, engage with us, and we will try and get one of these arranged very, very soon. Um, I see a few people there have suggested a return session. They're welcoming it. So Dizzy and Holger enjoy. Um, so thank you very much, folks. And um, Matt Gamble, I'll give, I'll not give him the last word, but I'll give him one of the last words. Says he's always thought to Sousa was a perfectly acceptable cut price carry grant, um, which is fair enough. And uh, quite a thunder thanks as well. So thank you, folks. Uh, yes, indeed, we could go on for hours. And I think we, we've gone on a bit longer than we meant to. And uh, if you do nothing else this week, um, plunk yourselves down to a reviewing of Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed and uh, think of Veronica, I think is, is probably the best way to celebrate uh, a life well lived. I agree. Folks, that's us. Uh, we're going to unlive ourselves now and uh, decompress but we'll catch you on social media